I'm Nan McKay, and I would like to introduce you today to Mark A. Willis. Mark is the Senior Policy Fellow at New York University's Furman Center for Real Estate and Urban Policy, conducting research, writing, and speaking on such urban-related policy issues as affordable housing, housing finance reform, community development, lending and investment, and the Community Reinvestment Act. Before joining the center, Mark was a visiting scholar at the Ford Foundation. And he is going to share his learnings and insights from that as he shared them with the government, with community groups and financial services industry to stabilize and revitalize urban areas. Mark founded Chase's Community Development Corporation and held a number of positions, including president of the Chase Manhattan Foundation and executive vice president for community development. And prior to that, Mark served as deputy commissioner for development in New York City's housing department in the mid 1980s as the city started rebuilding its housing stock under Mayor Cook. Prior to that, he was a regional economist at the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. Mark continues to serve on a number of not-for-profit boards involved in community development, and he has a law degree and a PhD in economics. So welcome, Mark Willis. Thank you, Nan. We're very happy to have you, and you're a fellow of the Academy of Housing and Community Communities, which means that you are recognized for your achievements in this field. But you know, you're also a fellow at New York University's Furman Center. So tell us a little bit about this status as fellow in these two areas. Well, I guess uh, the carryover uh, between the two is, I guess, having been involved in this industry for a fairly long time, uh, you get to have some, uh, a little bit of a title here. Um, what it means for, uh, at NYU is that I'm uh, part of the policy team here. Uh, the NYU uh, Furman Center is a joint center of the law school and uh, uh, Wagner School for Public Service here at NYU. And uh, we do a lot of work in um, urban policy and uh, particularly in affordable housing. So it's been great to settle here after uh, a long career in a number of different uh, public and private sector jobs and be able to both reflect on uh, what I've learned over those years and also share those with students and uh, more generally through the work of the uh, Furman Center. And I, I think the uh, American Academy is somewhat of the same, uh, an opportunity to share uh, what I've learned and to listen from other people who have a great deal of experience uh, in the world of housing and uh, community development to uh, think about how we can continue to make improvements and reflect on what we have succeeded and not succeeded in doing over, over the uh, past decades. Now, the Furman, Furman Center produces an annual State of New York City's Housing and Neighborhoods Report. Right. So talk a little bit about that. How did that come about? What is it? How does it work? It's really a signature report of the uh, NYU Center, and it has become sort of like a, a Bible or encyclopedia or whatever to many people. It's a publication uh, in physical form of a, you know, about a half inch or three quarters of an inch thick with all sorts of data about New York City. So you can find out very quickly what's happening and what has happened. We do put it every year uh, in the uh, housing world and in the uh, urban, uh, you know, land use uh, world. And it, you know, has uh, some specific chapters on uh, summary of the data. It has uh, the data are all broken down by what we call community districts. There are 59 here in New York City. Uh, so you can find out what's happened in your neighborhood. Uh, obviously very helpful for local city council folks. 
uh, to be able to do that. Um, and there is, uh, every year we do a special chapter called the focus chapter, just pick another topic that's important uh, for urban policy. Uh, and uh, that's a additional piece of, of the state of the city's housing and neighborhood annual report. So let's just talk a little bit about housing stability in general. What mm -hmm. are you finding in New York City on housing stability? Well, it, the first thing to, to, to note is uh, that's a hugely important uh, uh, topic here. Uh, people's ability to have housing stability can affect their health, can affect this, the education uh, of their children. It can affect their ability to get job, all of these uh, aspects uh, revolve around uh, housing stability. So the, the data we have uh, in the uh, state of the city's housing and neighborhood uh, report is always, it relies on, on publicly available data. You know, we've compiled it in a way to make it more useful. So it's uh, not, uh, it's giving you longer term trends. It's not telling you exactly what's happening now. Obviously with COVID, this has become a huge issue. Uh, there's a lot of concern about evictions uh, in the city. Uh, we're in an eviction moratorium at this point. Uh, so uh, some of the problems here are, are being delayed, uh, if not uh, uh, resolved. But obviously uh, it's very important uh, for people to be able to, families to be able to uh, have a stable home, to have as I said, a platform for health, education, um, and employment. So is that your primary current focus regarding local housing solutions, kind of what's happening during COVID at this point? So we have, uh, uh, I think you may be alluding to our website, so localhousingsolutions.org, uh, that we put together starting a number of years ago uh, to help localities develop a local housing strategy. And the way we made that happen is we formed a community of practice on local uh, housing policy and brought together 14 experts from across the country over the course of two years and five meetings to talk about what are the key issues that localities are facing, particularly at that point, we're focused on localities uh, with high housing costs. And uh, out of that, uh, we developed a website called localhousingsolutions.org, which is a single source for localities to go and look at and learn about what the issues and what the potentials are for their locality uh, to address the affordable housing challenges. Uh, there are uh, over 80 policies in there. Uh, they're divided into what we think are the four key categories to think about are the pillars of uh, increasing the supply of affordable housing, increasing the supply of housing overall to take the pressure off the affordable housing stock uh, to help people uh, stay in their homes uh, and help people find good quality housing. So uh, if, you know, from the, the staff person in some city where the mayor says, I know affordable housing is a problem, tell me what to do, uh, to cities that have fairly advanced affordable housing uh, strategies and programs that have implemented uh, those programs and policies. Uh, this is a, a source to go to to see what is the scope of what's possible and to think about what's most applicable to their locality. So Mark, it seems like you're going outside of New York, is that right? That's correct. You know, our expertise, traditionally, uh, you know, we focus, and we still do focus a lot on New York. We have some very special data, uh, uh, um, databases that we've developed that are uh, for New York City. Um, well, we were talking before about stability. We have put together some very interesting work and continue to on evictions data. Um, but uh, we also know that the lessons we've learned in New York uh, can help people across the country and shocking to people across the country as we actually know that we can learn from them as well. So. Uh, it's important to uh, be involved um, and be uh, working with people across the country. And also, you know, obviously federal policy matters. So uh, where we have a particular expertise in New York City, we are very much involved in housing policy and helping improve the state of housing policy across the country. 
Well, New York has been so much in the news because of COVID as we kind of worked mm -hmm. our way through that over the last few months for the rest of the country, looking at New York. And I'm wondering what the effect is you're seeing on people leaving the city in New York, what you think the effect will be on whether that's going to be mm. a center that comes back and what happens with the housing around it now, right. the jobs, right. the whole big picture. Tell yeah, right. us yeah, no, no, I, I, about I, that. Yeah, I think everybody is uh, wondering about that. And uh, as I'm quick to say, I'm not in the forecast business, but there's a lot of ways to think about this to be helpful uh, and uh, understanding better what the uh, outcomes are. First of all, and the most important thing is to remember the resilience of New York City. Uh, I've been uh, in New York City since the 70s, uh, and uh, obviously the city had was in deep decline then. It lost over 600,000 jobs between 69 and 76, a million in population between 70 and 80. So it was a very, very tough time. And that's when I was working uh, in the early 80s for the Koch administration to uh, start what was then called the 10-year housing plan and rebuild the city. I must say then, none of us could imagine how far the city would thrive. Uh, you know, we're now at an all-time high in population, probably stable at a certain level in the last year, and we're all-time high in employment. Uh, cities have become fashionable, and uh, New York was uh, at what one of the major cities, some of called superstar cities um, in the country. So the, the question really is, what is COVID? How is that gonna change it? Uh, we look at history, the New York City's always coming back. So uh, I, I can be very optimistic in the long run. We can look at the uh, bombing of the World Trade Center and uh, early in, uh, in 2000, people said, uh, New York will never build another skyscraper. People will never go up in another skyscraper. Uh, that just turns out uh, not to have been true. People uh, adjusted fairly quickly. Uh, and in fact, uh, there's an exhibit that you can see online uh, at uh, a museum called Skyscraper, uh, Skyscraper Museum, the website skyscraper.org. Uh, it's a little uh, plug for my wife, who's the founder and director of that museum. Looking at the super tall buildings in the world. Those buildings are as tall as the Empire State Building or taller. And the city in the world that has the most of those is New York City. So, you know, if you predicted it, uh, uh, after the bombings that New York would be there, no one would believe you. So uh, there's, there's gotta be a basic faith here um, and respect that uh, New York has always come back. So uh, the question is, how will it come back? Will we have as much office space need that? Will those buildings, some of the older ones, be converted into residential? Well, certainly some hotels will seem likely to get converted to affordable housing. Uh, the city will look different. People may not go to work every day, uh, go to an office every day. There are lots of things that's hard to tell. Some of those trends were happening anyway. Um, so uh, I would be basically you know, assuming that we have a vaccine and people can feel safe. Uh, traveling to work, I think uh, we'll find uh, New York will reinvent itself one more time. Well, I think that's very astute because the reinvention, I think, is exactly what's going on. As we look at more and more companies with remote workers and more and more people that like to be remote workers, you wonder what the cities are going to look like, and especially when you're looking at New York City and Los Angeles, you know, the two kind of epicenters of, of big buildings and skyscrapers and all these right. uh, things where right. people congregate. And then you wonder all the ancillary right. services around that, whether it's restaurants or all printing businesses right. or whatever, right. you know, where is that going and how will in, how will New York City look right. in the future. Right. So, you know, it, it, when we did economic development, I also worked for the deputy mayor for economic development for a time back in the early 80s. We were worried about keeping companies here. What we've learned more recently, it's about where people want to live. And again, assuming we can deal with uh, uh, the vaccine or, or the equivalent here, 
I think young people will still want to live in a city. So maybe it's not only because the work may be here, but because there's something very special about being in a place where there are uh, lots of other people, lots of culture, lots of restaurants, as you said. You know, uh, immigration is also important to the future of the city. The city's always had large flows of people in and out, uh, immigrants coming in, and maybe the next generation leaving, uh, other uh, young people coming here, and people then moving to the suburbs. Uh, some of those trends have changed a little bit over time, uh, and that's resulted in the city actually growing quite significantly, as I said, to all-time highs in, in population. So, you know, what's going to drive people's choice? Young people don't want a car. And there's, there's real advantages in being in, in, in New York City or cities like New York, and I'm, I don't think those are going away. I think uh, they're definitely on pause. So uh, th this is a uh, definitely created uh, an interim here that uh, we're all going to be figuring out what the new normal is over the next few years. It's almost a vibrancy that the city has that you just don't see elsewhere. Right. Well, yeah, I'm a, I'm a convert to that. <laughs> so having come from, uh, actually from Portland, Maine, uh, I'm the exact kind of person that that's what New York means to me as well. Let's uh, switch a little bit. I would like to hear about GSE reforms in the financing of multifamily properties. Yeah, so, um, you know, at the time of the subprime crisis, I joined a group called the Mortgage uh, Finance Working Group uh, that uh, had all sorts of experts on weekly calls. And, you know, we were all trying to figure out uh, what's the next best policy. And people were talking at that time about you know, we need to uh, get rid of Fannie and Freddie. No one's talking about that anymore. The question is what to do with Fannie and Freddie out of conservatorship. But a key part of that, which was not in everybody's um, radar screen, was the multifamily part. And the multifamily part of Fannie and Freddie never ran into trouble. It worked fine. And, you know, argued back then and argue now that they're is an important role for, for Fannie and Freddie in the multifamily. Question is whether it should stay part of the single family. I think people kind of just assume that's what's, uh, what's going to happen. Uh, but that everybody thought we needed to do something dramatically different on the single family side. The, the truth of the matter was, uh, is, and what I said way back then, is uh, mortgages are getting made. There's no great crisis. And that if you want to uh, if, uh, if you want to try and ch make some dramatic changes, uh, there's no reason to do that. So uh, Congress tried uh, hard to come up with a, a reinventing Fannie and Freddie, but without Fannie and Freddie, basically having to write rules for almost every part of it. And you know, it was not surprising to me that Congress, when they really came down and said, why are we looking to jump basically, as I, I would describe, off a cliff where we don't know what the bottom is really going to look like when we have a system that works. We're still there. Fannie and Freddie, there, there are things definitely can be improved, and they've made some, uh, you know, some major changes since then, but the system works. So the question is, should they be recapitalized and spun off? So, um, recap and release is the terminology people use. Uh, or uh, be transformed into uh, uh, making sort of conservative a more permanent uh, event here, but by formalizing it as a utility. Uh, there are other uh, variations on those. I, that's, the, that's the big question, which is, should it be returned totally to the private sector? There are those who would argue that that didn't work so well. You know, privatize of gains and socialization of the losses. Um, or kept uh, much more closely controlled by the government for its public purpose uh, that it provides, which is providing more universal availability of mortgages across the country. Which side would you come down on? Well, I, uh, I come down, actually, um, I was going to explain it in more detail, but uh, to answer it straightforward, uh, the utility makes a lot of sense to me. Uh, that uh, uh, there's a great government public interest in how those uh, institutions uh, 
who they serve, how they serve them, if they're the internal cross subsidy from better quality borrowers to less quality uh, people who's, uh, uh, let's say, lower credit scores, uh, minimizing the variation in pricing uh, across those. So being much more careful about risk-based pricing than I think a private sector firm would, would totally be. Uh, there's potential there for cross-subsidization also of affordable housing more generally. Right now, there's a housing trust fund and uh, uh, that Fannie and Freddie uh, contribute to. Um, that could actually be expanded uh, as a, a source of uh, funding for affordable housing more generally. So I, I think that, um, and, and the, you know, and during the business cycles, th this is the counter cyclical work there is really very important. And private sector firms tend all when times get tough to retreat. What we need is for Fannie and Freddie to step forward and make sure that mortgages continue to be available in a recession. So, um, in fact, they did that pretty well in the last recession. So I think it's really important for government to play uh, a key role and a utility is, I think, a good mechanism for doing that. So we can come up with a better mechanism, I'm fine, but uh, the basic goals need to be met. What do you feel are the benefits and the challenges of, of the revival of cities? Well, it's hard. I, you know, from my point of view, the, 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 uh, there are challenges, but the revival of cities is an amazing thing and, and very important. Whether uh, and uh, I do a little bit of work in the environmental field, whether from an environmental point of view um, or from a uh, technological innovation, creative point of view, there have been lots of studies that show an immensely these these special superstar cities have been amazingly innovative and creative, um, and that helps the economy grow, or that helps provide employment. Um, the challenges are, you know, we're now really focused on racial equity. We have areas in the cities that have been neglected for a long time, um, mainly a minority areas. We we need to focus on those and make sure that all communities in the city are areas of opportunity, whether that's opportunity for good health, opportunity for jobs, opportunity for education. Uh, all of those uh, areas need to be equally available in whatever neighborhood uh, there are. So I view what's happening in cities as a great opportunity uh, to do that. Uh, the adjustment to that has uh, uh, been a little bit difficult at times. So. In my housing work, uh, when uh, in the mid 80s, 80% 80 of Harlem, uh, I'm sorry, 60% of the, of the housing in Harlem was owned by the city because private sector had walked away and much of that was abandoned. Uh, so it was a great opportunity to rebuild that part of Harlem with no negative effects and for a long time um, uh, that went uh, very well. Uh, eventually, uh, the housing got all rebuilt and Harlem was refilled. Uh, and then you have this issue of preserving neighborhoods and neighborhood culture uh, and making sure people who are there forever aren't forced out unnecessarily. So that's, you know, where there was empty space, revitalizing cities worked, where it, uh, there's more competition for space. Uh, it gets to, in part, what I talked about before is we just need more housing. Employment in the cities grow much faster than housing has. And by the way, it would be really nice if we could get this done on a regional basis. Uh, that's one area I'm less optimistic. Uh, there are efforts uh, uh, around uh, cities to have more cooperation, whether Boston has tried to work with their suburbs, King County around Seattle has, um, there's revenue sharing in Minneapolis. Uh, St. Paul, um, but the politics of that is very hard. Uh, but, you know, uh, our, uh, our suburbs here could be very helpful here in providing more housing as the city is trying to do both in general, uh, market rate housing, but also affordable housing. Several of the guests that we've had on the show talk a lot about uh, transportation, medical, schools, mm -hmm. 
and how that needs to be looked at as services around the employment areas. It's not just two different things, but it's things that they have, we have to merge together. I would think that would be true in New York City. Well, you know, uh, transit or development, TOD, is a very, very important idea. The, the idea that we have a um, commuter rail that goes to uh, parking lots instead of multifamily housing, hopefully of mixed income, uh, is something that is slowly changing. Uh, New Jersey has been quite aggressive in that area, and there are um, uh, suburbs of New York where you're seeing a lot more development than train stations. Um, that just makes sense, and again, it makes it easier not to have a car or to rely on a car so much. Um, I'm not sure what you're referring to in healthcare. Obviously, health, housing and health are very interrelated, uh, but one key thing is that a lot of cities, their main industries are hit, uh, meds and eds, right? educational institutions and medical institutions, and they need to play more of a role uh, in the city and can be really helpful both in terms of working in their communities, but also uh, employment and uh, vendor relationships, whatever. Um, th there needs to be thinking about that. And, you know, I, and some medical institutions now are actually helping to build housing. They realize uh, that that's important for them to be doing for, not just for their own staff, but to build the neighborhoods around these institutions, which for historical reasons in many cases have declined the most of any areas in the city. I think you'll be very interested in listening to David Smith and sure. I think it's a podcast and perhaps a YouTube mm -hmm. that is not up yet, but okay. he is doing some pretty uh, amazing work in the healthy homes area. Mm -hmm. And it seems like it would tie in exactly to what you're saying. So. I'll try to remember to let you know, but also watch sure. that one because yeah. I think that's something that is directly tied right. to what you're talking about. But David's been often been on the cutting edge of, uh, of new and innovative ideas. Uh, and yeah. uh, he, there is a podcast from him, which I listened to, but obviously this is an additional one. This is one I haven't even done yet, but we'll okay. be doing it in the next couple of days and right. I know what he's going to talk about. Okay. So how do you feel that urban revitalization has really changed if you look at the last 20 years, or do you think you've covered that? I, I probably, you know, the quick summary is there's been this huge revival in many, oh, I would say in a limited number of cities. A lot of cities are still, which we sometimes refer as legacy cities, are still struggling with dealing with the loss of manufacturing and this increased focus on a smaller number of cities. So one of the challenges now, and maybe this COVID will help a little bit, is that uh, more people, young people, will not uh, be so quick to leave some of these legacy cities and stay there and rebuild them. Um, but you know, many cities, the population is now a fraction of what it was before, and, and housing is a huge problem um, in very different ways from New York. Housing because it's vacant. There are empty lots. Um, there are so there's and there's, you know there's too many homes. So there's the market for housing is um, certainly not uh, thriving uh, there. And uh, uh, neighborhoods uh, that uh, and uh, you know commercial centers that relied on houses around them and communities are uh, are suffering there. So th there needs to be a real focus on legacy cities and what. Uh, what to do there and, uh, you know, COVID may be helpful in sort of spreading out a little bit of where people uh, live. We'll see. We predicted for years that the internet was gonna be the end of cities and it was exactly the opposite uh, uh, for these large cities. So uh, again, be very careful in, in making your predictions. Tell us a little bit more about your lifetime work and your latest work on CRA reform and its outlook, and then describe what CRA is, so people that don't know. Well. Sure, sure. Well, CRA is an acronym for the Community Reinvestment Act, which was passed in 1977 by Congress, a few years after it 
pass a legal under this uh, Mortgage Disclosure Act uh, to uh, help people better understand who was getting mortgages in terms of their income and their uh, and where they were living. And then this notion of place-based development became a key part of uh, the Community Reinvestment Act. And it has uh, been went through a major reform in the mid 90s to be more outcome measured. Uh, and uh, there has been ever since a lot of interest in further modernizing it. In particular, uh, you know, 1977 uh, banks, uh, it's hard for people to understand, but some states only allowed a bank to have its one office. It couldn't even have branches. Uh, there was very limited interstate banking. Uh, interstate banking got dealt with in the 90s, and now we have inter internet banking where a bank may actually have no place that it takes deposits. Uh, it does everything through the internet. So there's definitely a need to uh, uh, deal with that, uh, figure out how to require, and as Community Reinvestment Act name says, get banks to reinvest in the communities where they take deposits. That was the basic notion. And uh, now, um, with internet banks, what does that mean? And that needs to be well-defined, as well as there are a lot of lessons learned in all these years that I think can uh, be taken to heart in, in reform. Uh, unfortunately for the for reform, it's required that all the banking regulators, and we got three of them now, have to be in agreement. That turned out to be a very difficult process, so very little happened after the 95 reforms until uh, this administration. And the uh, previous controller of the currency, who left the day after he implemented these new reforms, uh, left the administration. Uh, he uh, uh, saw uh, uh, that, you know, in order to modernize here, somebody needed to take the lead. He took the lead, pushed very hard. Unfortunately for most of us, uh, his approach uh, really did not make, did not work. Did not work to expand the amount of uh, community development that banks would be incented to do um, and didn't really solve the internet problem uh, very well either. So um, the talk here is if there's a change in administration, these new regs by the OCC who had it in the end goal by it alone because the FDIC did not agree to go along and the Fed did not agree to go along. Those are the, the three regulators. Um, you know, there's a lot of pressure here to, can't we stop whatever this reform is and uh, get the three regulators together to uh, agree on the reforms that, that uh, I, th I think there's broad uh, support for. And when I say broad, I think the banks and the community groups, while they disagree on a number of things, there is broad support and unanimity about what needs to be done. So I'm very optimistic. I know that depending on how the next administration, um, so I don't think a Trump administration will make any effort here. Uh, that I assume they think they're done. Um, but if uh, uh, Biden uh, wins here, I think there'll be a, a strong impetus to get reform done. Um, and I would predict it will take at least a year or two, given how fast they've moved in the past. And I think, as I said, there's enough consensus here to, I think, to actually make something happen that will improve CRA. Um, you can criticize lots of things about it, but it has made a big impact. Certainly in my previous institution in Chase, I used to say if CRA hadn't been there, I would not have had a job. I would not have been part of an operation that lent out billions of dollars a year uh, in affordable housing, mortgages, uh, and multifamily in particular, single family mortgages, small business loans, um, loans to CDFIs who make a big difference in, in their communities. All of that uh, has followed from passage of the CRA. And that's pretty much what your experience was with uh, Chase Manhattan Foundation? Yeah, well, I, you know, the foundation was interesting. Um, and I would say, you know, that was more description of what happened in community development overall. Uh, the foundation, you know, like all foundations, uh, needs to 
think about where it wants to focus its efforts. And one of the key areas was education. And, uh, you know, I've often said, you know, the best affordable housing program is a good job. The best community development uh, program is uh, education and helping your children. Uh, but uh, my work at, uh, uh, learning as head of the foundation was how hard it is to make progress on the education side. Uh, we often go around and see some amazing principles, amazing stories, but scaling that up for whatever reason has been really hard for this country to do. Uh, and it's something really important for uh, trying to transform the lives of children who are born in neighborhoods that we now talk about as your zip code is your destiny. It shouldn't be. Your zip code should be your destiny, and that destiny should be great because your zip code is great. And that's why I was talking before about making sure that every neighborhood is a neighborhood of all. That was certainly true back in the era of public housing, where, you know, if you had that address, then mm -hmm. that definitely pigeonholed you. Right. Well, you know, public housing is really interesting and needs, desperately needs money to fix buildings up that are 50, 60, 70 years old. You know, it really started in the 1930s and got going, you know, uh, after the Second World War, a lot was built here. It's very old. Um, and unfortunately, what we've learned is government owning housing doesn't mean it's going to be well treated. Uh, and that's, that, that needs to be a focus now. But many people don't realize that housing uh, authority, certainly in New York City, you had to have a job to even get in. It was viewed as a temporary you know, uh, stepping stone for people uh, and to make sure that uh, children had access to light and air um, and an opportunity to, to do well. Uh, and we've let a lot of those properties uh, deteriorate. Uh, and we've actually you know, made them less viable as communities. Uh, and you know, a lot of people in there are disabled and elderly. Understandable, those are the folks that aren't gonna leave. Um, most of the people can work, do work, but we, we need to fix up those buildings and we need to make sure that those communities are integrated with the communities around them. Um, again, so everybody can have an opportunity to thrive. How do you feel you have bridged theory and practice, both in the public and private sectors? That's a great question, and that is what I view that I kind of bring here. So obviously all that education I describe a little bit as the theory, although uh, certainly the economics is, and to some extent the legal is. Um, and, uh, but I've existed in um, many different situations in the public sector, the private sector, uh, and I've always tried to bring uh, to those uh, discussions both a sense of the bigger picture in what I'll call the theory part of it, um, and also be very, very practical about what, what can be done. And uh, by bringing those people from uh, all sides together, you can often find solutions problems that uh, elude you uh, without that kind of uh, understanding of the big picture um, and uh, uh, being very practical about the world we live in and uh, what can be done given the systems that we live in. What do you feel is the biggest challenge in the housing and communities arena today? Well, um, <laughs> We've probably, we've probably gone and uh, mentioned uh, those, but we don't have uh, enough affordable housing. It's, uh, you know, people have pushed and said housing is a right. You know, there was a 1949 Housing Act. Everybody's entitled to decent affordable housing. Uh, we haven't achieved that. Uh, and I, we need to keep working how to do that in our system. To those who think the public housing is a solution, I think, you know, the experience with public housing is a little bit sobering there. For those who think that the private sector can do it, I don't think we're seeing that happen uh, here. So it's got to be some combination of public-private partnership um, and public policies. Uh, one thing of particular importance here, and there's a lot of talk about it, local zoning. We, we need more supply. Everything that uh, um, 
somebody tries to build housing should not be able to be thwarted so easily as it is now. And as a result, uh, we are, uh, the housing stock we have is becoming more and more expensive. With all you've done, if there's a life lesson to pass along to younger people, and I'm talking about people probably in their 20s, mm -hmm. what, would it, what would it be for you? Well, I, I, you know, I, I'm going to change that slightly and just say, I think the, the young people in their 20s is an amazing generation. They've been growing up in a very diverse world. They don't see all of the lines between people and what they should do is stay with that because I think that that can be transformational if people really are open to diversity and open to uh, making sure that everybody uh, prospers here not just a few. I so agree with you. Is there anything else you'd like to say to our listeners? No I think that you know we, we've covered here I think Basically, you know, um, you know, I'd like to say something profound and some, you know, great prediction here, but I think COVID is, as I said, very sobering. I don't think we really know how this will uh, play out totally uh, on the economy and on our cities, but I do know we need to really focus on this issue of making sure people have a safe and affordable housing, where, you know, it started off talking about housing instability. Uh, that's no pun intended, that's a foundation for a thriving society and for thriving people is that people have a place to live that is decent and that, that remains uh, a huge effort. And you can't separate the whole issue of racial equity uh, from that, from our history here. So uh, dealing with those two issues is really important. Well, Mark, thank you so much for your participation. You know, I'm so glad you are the person out there that's bridging theory and practice because, you know, you could get into an ivory tower and not ever look at how it really plays out, and you seem to be looking at right. both sides. Right, right. I also think that it's uh, very nice to have you currently in the workforce today where you're still looking at these things because a lot of people have retired out that I've been interviewing. <laughs> and it's nice to see that you're still in there and you're still, you know, what did they say, tilting at windmills as well? <laughs> That's a phrase so, I've used many times. Yeah, yes. you're looking at the big picture yeah. and you're looking at not only New York City, but you're looking at local community development right. throughout the country and being mm. more of a model or trying to be helpful in the modeling area. And I really appreciate you doing that. No, oh, well, thank you. And I'm very fortunate to be at an academic institution where those big ideas and those concerns uh, keep us going. And we have young people to help uh, them uh, face these challenges. So I feel very lucky. Thank you, Mark. Thank you very much.